Hello and welcome to the I Am Woman Project, where every week we have deep thought-provoking and interesting conversations with thought leaders, change instigators, rule breakers and creative minds who think differently, sparking creativity and inspiration. Our special guests on our show cover a variety of topics just for you and they share their personal stories to inspire, motivate and empower you, our listener. The I Am Woman podcast is produced for your enjoyment and show notes are found at www.catherineplano.com. Come back often and feel free to add the podcast to your favorite RSS feed or iTunes. All links are in the show notes. Now let's get into the show. For 30 years, our guest today has been a singer, songwriter, producer and performer with a repertoire that's really diverse. Jazz, gospel, traditional folk, country, cabaret shows, festival circuits, arts administration and amongst all that, she finished her Masters of Music in 2015 and is currently in the throes of a Doctorate of Musical Arts Research. Singer and researcher Leah Cottrell is our guest today for the I Am Woman podcast. It's so great to have you here. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Melissa. I have to apologise for the fact that my budgie is a little bit hyperactive right now. (laughs) And your your listeners will be having to manage their perceptions in a really different new way. So reading through the information on your website today, I was blown away by the range of the different genres you've explored over the years. Some people who say love jazz music would most likely say they can't stand that country stuff or traditional folkies would say they want nothing to do with chart topping covers. But you've gone to all those places as a singer and performer. Was that on purpose? Did you want to try it all? I think that. In fact, the barriers between all those styles are very tribal and uh, they come, um, I, would, I would say artificial, except it's not because it's like any kind of cultural use of clothing or, you know, any formation of identity through stuff, storytelling and, and music. People use it as a flag to rally around because it's got really, it's got a lot of potency. To me, they're all songs, they're all vignettes, they're all three to five minutes, they're all telling a story. They're all, they've got much more in common in their DNA than they do um, have um, in contrast to one another and I've always found that really odd. And I know that the last thing I should have done as a commercial, you know, I could have had a really good career as a blues singer really if I had just stuck to that for the last 30 years but I might be a little bit crazier than I am. All of those songs are documents that speak to me and that um, that ask me, the little songs, they, they lie there and they ask me to come over and have a go at them even if I don't do them well. Even if no one wants to hear it, uh, the songs themselves have such an allure for me that I I couldn't resist. And throughout your career as a professional singer and songwriter and all the other wonderful things you've done, you've also been dealing with some personally really difficult times with mental health issues and um, caring responsibilities of family members. How did you deal with all of that? Um, Piecemeal and gradually and bumping into the furniture really. Uh, I think in lots of ways, um, the the earlier days of my success, when I had a waist, I was a young woman, I was singing jazz, everybody loved it, everyone was turning up, you know, I was high on the hog, I was in the newspapers, all that stuff. There was a big spell of that. And that was, um, that was actually really challenging and in the end I couldn't keep that up, that pace, because... I didn't have a foundation. So now I'm 55, right, and I've I've been facing up to a lot of responsibilities and I've done a lot of caring for my family who've got complicated mental health issues. And in lots of ways now is the first time in my life that I've had enough space and air around me to really reflect on the whole journey. And my mother had agoraphobia for 20 years and didn't leave the house on her own 
my brother had a schizophrenic breakdown and he was in a very poor state for a long time. And all of that was very heartrending and I felt strongly the injustice of all of that. And on top of that, we felt very socially isolated. We'd internalised that mental health stigma. Um, we didn't actually socialise with other people. We were like the Adams family living next to the Brady Bunch in Upper Mount Gravatt. It was very, you know, a cultural schism between us and other people and mental health wasn't a topic anyone would speak about. That was the 1970s. Then when I was a young adult and, and reaching out to try and find ways to be a singer because I really, I there's no explanation for it, I just needed to sing and perform and gradually found my way into professional circles, gradually found... Um, a way to use the skill that I innately felt that I had, I, I became instantly overextended because I didn't know how to be successful. I didn't know how to be social. Did you doubt your own mental health at that time too? Well, I did. I had I developed an anxiety disorder and I was clinically depressed. I don't think there's any question about that. I actually did a whole bunch of counselling around that and I overcame most of my anxieties. I still have panic attacks when I'm driving and I didn't drive for 20 years but I've got my license again now. Oh congratulations. I had to actually restructure myself from the ground up and I started doing that by studying music which I'd never done and for me that um, that wrestle that you have in your own mind when you're studying that reaching out for new knowledge that sort of laying down new kinds of um, understandings and memory, that's a real joy to me. That's the stuff I can do. So do you think that sometimes, you know, the very things like in this case that cause the most pain or discomfort, they are the things that might define the direction that your life will take? It doesn't have to be this all-consuming conflict all the time. You can actually make sense of it. Well, that's my experience. I wasn't socialised well enough to be able to go and do a job interview, but I could sing. Wherever I was hitting my head against a wall, I could find another window somewhere. The window might not be conveniently located. There might have been some long periods where I was underemployed or unemployed because I wasn't functional in certain ways, but I would always work my way out of things and towards the place where I felt safe, which was in my imagination, in my intellect. You know, so my journey has been about finding the strengths in my weakness. The energy it takes to fight my way up again always unleashes something really new and really inventive mm -hmm. and really creative and um, something that actually then sets me on a new pathway for a long time. So, you know, I don't have any superannuation. <laughs> superannuation is overrated. Yes, yeah, overrated. <laughs> the, the big but in all of this is that I have had quite amazing adventures where I've touched the edge of what is possible for me to experience, like the high and the low, the left and the right, east and the west, north and the south. I've been to all points of my compass. And so the stuff that I've brought back from there makes me um, more sturdy every day. To have been so far down and to have the creative surge, is, is the creative surge worth it? Is it something that compensates for how, how down you might have to go? I don't know about compensate. Like the word balance appeals to me because, you know, I um, when I needed to, about five years ago, I needed to think about how I might work as an older woman. I thought, you know what, bookkeeping, right, bookkeeping, love it. When you say bookkeeping and then we're talking about creativity and singing and emotion, it just doesn't quite fit. <laughs> I'm just getting to that. Um, so, so I went out and did a diploma of accounting at the TAFE College and I really hooked on to the idea of double entry accounting. It's a wonderful thing. Like over our lifetimes, we balance our liabilities and assets. So when we're saying that the creative surge may compensate for the darkness of hitting rock bottom, you can't underestimate the pain that people go through, uh, uh, circumstantial stuff, but also the inner storms that people experience, like my family members who've been so challenged by their own internal states. But you can't redeem it. It is pain. It is suffering. But you can work through it and you can see a balance 
when they're put all end to end. If you survive the journey and you come out of it with your dignity intact, you can see it all side by side and come to terms with it and come to acceptance. I think that the word balance really appeals to me. So back when it was really acute, when you were, say, in your 20s, and you'd be you'd be heading out to a venue to perform whatever music you wanted to at the time that was really resonating with you, and you'd come home to chaos. What did you do? Performing is a really um, a kind of a zen activity. You sort of become an empty vessel. And then when you're all emptied out from giving it all away or channeling what's in the room, or, you know, doing your shamanistic behaviours, Afterwards, this is what happened, was I ground myself down gradually and then in my early 30s I needed to lie down. I was out there adventuring, exploring, doing what I could do because I've got some strange circuitry that means that I want to do that. But, you know, it's like costs. It has costs. And then I had a couple of years where I just lay down, really took it slow, but on the whole made a, a pretty good recovery, found some new friendships, started my music education. So then I was able to finish that degree. Honestly, when I'm in front of people on a stage with clean hair and a a reasonably forgiving garment, I really don't care. Getting back to empathy now, you studied empathy in music. What does that really mean? And what does it mean in relation to your latest show, The Pleasure of Sad Songs? Well, The Pleasure of Sad Songs is the show I wrote in my Masters of Music. Once I'd done my diploma of accounting, um, I'd actually reached a point where we were at peak dysfunction with my family. Once my father died in 2002, my mother, who was ageing in her 70s, and my brother, who'd lived at home all his life, schizophrenic brother, their orbit sort of gradually decayed over the next 10 years um, to the point where her dementia Um, upset him to such a degree that he went back into acute care. And that all happened about the time I was doing my bookkeeping studies. She was at home with her own power of attorney in a terrible state, like terrible, like frightening and dysfunction of an extraordinary nature that no one would intervene in. Um, And I, as a family member, wasn't able to intervene for a few different reasons, a lot of them to do with current privacy legislation. And so I was continuously worried and extremely stressed and my brother was stuck in hospital for 13 months because he didn't have the life skills to be a homeless guy so they couldn't just chuck him out. And because of my circumstances, I had a situational kind of clinical depression and so I thought, well, I can't, I can barely talk to people because um, empathy has limits and costs and when someone you know is going through that much crisis that constantly it takes a very special kind of person to be able to continue to support someone in that dilemma most people drift off and I'm not saying that's a bad thing I'm just saying it's a natural outcome of the limitations of empathy and uh, the necessity for people to protect themselves from the costs of caring and and so that was a very interesting thing so I thought well I can't gig I can barely speak to people It's all too traumatising. So I'm going to do my Masters of Music because that will be fun because I like using my brain and I like writing and I like, you know, thinking about stuff. So as a kind of background research to writing the show about my family, seeing the right thing to do to bring all the themes of my life together, the music and the family dysfunction together in one place, the correct background research to me seemed to be the functional connections that underlie emotion induction, empathy and intersubjectivity in music because there is a kind of mirroring of those mechanisms in the dysfunction of trying to continue to care for and love people who are very costly to love, people who are hard to support, people with really serious psychiatric illnesses, psychotic illnesses, Um, don't have much insight into their own thoughts, let alone those of other people. So there's a catastrophic failure of empathy that goes on in those relationships as well. So the functionality of what I can achieve in a room full of people when the light's on me and I've got a good PA and a band, as compared to the difficulty of forming connections, um, not so much with my family, who I love, and it's just, It may be a bit one way sometimes, but I love them. 
but the people who I would have believed were being paid to care for their interests and yet were finding ways to not care for their interests. Like that was all very interesting. The, the whole thematic um, material around connection became the subject of the background study, became the subject of the creative writing, and it was this constant subject of my experience in dealing with mental health and community services. So on the one hand, you're trying to make sense of it, and then on the other hand, you're actually really exposing yourself to these things that are deeply personal and intimate aspects of your life and probably things that were quite secretive for such a time too uh, with all that secrecy and mystery around mental health they're really tricky and hard topics to talk about yeah my family secluded themselves and I was aware from an early age that um, generally people don't want to hear about it or talk about it or know about it it's that thing of empathy. It's, it could be too costly to care. So people want to sort of shade themselves from that kind of knowledge. And so it seemed to me very important to make a piece of work that was so safe and comforting and so focused on um, the balance of beauty with suffering and the balance of recovery with suffering. You know, so countervailing kinds of themes to make it possible for people to get closer to the subject. That was my task. And how do you feel about it now that you've rewritten the show, haven't you? I've had to revise it because it was first written two years ago and things have progressed since then. You know, things have changed, um, you know, things have progressed in lots of little funny ways that needed to be managed in the script. But basically the message is still the same which is um, that loving people, and some people are more difficult, but the, the challenge of loving in those difficult circumstances is rewarded. And there's a lot of sublime beauty in remembering that my mother and my brother were once, you know, brilliant and beautiful, damn near perfect. So that, that kind of redeeming suffering that you can express through music, song and story is there. It's that interesting thing where people can experience emotion without consequence because it's in a cultural setting. You know, so people can come to the show and this, it's very interesting because I've had opportunities to do excerpts of the show in lots of different settings with general audiences but also with audiences of mental health consumers and audiences of um, mental health family carers. And, and at fairly large events like um, conferences, did a conference with TAFE educators in January and, of course, the TAFE educators are all preloaded kind of um, rescuers, so they were beside themselves. Was that you singing or was that you speaking? Both. Okay. The speaking and the singing are so, um, they're a counterpoint that they enrich one another. You can't, like it, The whole point of my show is that the intensity of the singing is the payoff to the storytelling. So the, the storytelling actually brings in the, the important points of the narrative and then the song will um, resolve it emotionally in some way. Is there a definitive line between what you can safely share as an artist on stage where you yeah. know you, you'll be okay, you're not going to fall apart, or are you always kind of pushing that edge, coming close to it? Oh, no, no, I'm nowhere near that age. I mean, that's the whole point. People are very funny about this. Do we really think that actors go to hell every night? Do we really think that singers burn up with heartache when they open their mouths? We're very funny about it. We want to believe it. It's like when I used to have bottle red hair, you know, and you would say to someone, I've dyed my hair, and they still didn't believe it because they wanted it to be red. You know, and an audience, they just want you to sweat. They want you to weep. If you could bleed, they would love it. Yeah, it's because we want to be transformed to a different place. But we can be transported. I would see my task as being to open the gateway for people to be transported. But you're actually transporting yourself as an audience member. It's not, you know, um, it's an inter. The the concept of intersubjectivity is that the creation of meaning happens between people. Like I'm not creating meaning for you. You're creating meaning out of what I'm offering you. And so when I'm offering um, a gateway to an emotional state or I actually think I'm more often, most often, I try very hard anyway, most often to be offering um, stuff that is not so much about emotion as ideas and 
uh, may imply emotion, but that's going to be your emotion. It may unlock the audience's emotions. In fact, I'm hoping it will. And in fact, I'm hoping that I judge it so well that among my audience there'll be a common response because at that point we're all getting high. You're actually processing so fast and so furiously so many different sensations that are internal and external that when it's going really well, you're not consciously thinking. You can actually lose sense of time. time. There can be time distortions, memory loss. There's a whole lot of things that can happen in performance, um, but they can only happen when the audience is actually um, focusing really strong attention on the performer. And so it's a combinational thing. I'm trying to unlock the doors of your emotions. That really doesn't mean I'm going over Niagara Falls in a barrel. <laughs> ah, it's all over for me now. It's all changed. <laughs> ah, the illusions both. I actually think it's more interesting than that. It's like, yeah, there is emotion contagion, you know. And, well, part of this is that we're so, we're so innately, like the thing I'm going to do in my doctorate, most normal people through their childhood come to know how their words, expressions, um, you know, the way you use your voice is going to affect other people. That's part of what our basic operating equipment is. I have a lot of intense feelings and thoughts and they are, you know, I have a very transparent relationship with my voice Maybe it's because I wasn't properly socialized. Maybe I'm differently abled. But I reckon I have a very expressive relationship with my voice. So speaking or singing, I think that there are a lot of cues for the listener. And I'm trying to bring the listener with me. So there is a lot of stuff. My little voice will throb and it'll rise and fall and it'll increase and decrease in tempo. And all of that stuff's happening just under the level of consciousness because all I'm thinking really is, believe me, believe me, believe me. I've I've already done all the work on what I'm saying, why I'm saying it, who I think you are. When we come to the moment of exchange, all I want is for you to believe me. And, you know, I I don't want you to necessarily cry, but I'm very pleased when you do. But more than anything, all I want is for you to believe in the authenticity of what I'm saying and singing. So how has sharing your story in this way affected others? Oh, it's very odd. Why? So people who've experienced any of the same sort of stuff, a lot of people want to tell me their stuff. I have to be really available after the show because people will want to tell me their own story. It'll it'll start the things rolling in their heads. And what's that like for you to listen to those stories? Well, it's an honour and a privilege, you know, Mm -hmm. that people uh, believe that I'm a safe set of ears I don't have to fix them up I'm pretty well I'm pretty well sure of whose feelings are whose in that situation and usually I'm like a you know like a stunned mullet anyway because I've just done that thing where time changes and stuff so I'm sort of you know reeling around so they can tell me their stuff it doesn't mean I'm going to carry it with me but I have to be available to listen and be sincere about listening and then there are other people who've not had that kind of trouble in their life and they think you're terribly brave (laughs) But you are. It is very brave. You are. Really. You laugh. It's true. Well, it's normal for me. I think um, it's more interesting to think of me as a freak than brave. But, um, yeah, this is not my normal thing to do at this point in my life. This feels normal. This doesn't feel brave. I haven't sucked it all up. Brave would be going and doing a job interview. It's not about pathology. It's not about diagnosis. It's about function. I'm just particular, I just have a particular set of things where I function well. And then so there's the people who, for them, it's very close. And and the people who want to talk, I reckon, the people who want to talk the most are the people who haven't quite resolved it or haven't really um, digested their experiences. And you can see, you know, they come up and they look in their eyes and the look on their face is very particular. And then there are the people who are completely puzzled by it because it's sort of like I'm talking to them I've come from the planet where all the mad people are and I've come to tell them about what that's like. And then there was on one occasion only a lady who had to withdraw from the audience and leave because her own issues were still peaking. The dysfunction for her was actually completely unresolved. She was really at the pointy end of these processes of dealing with people who had dementia and mental illness in her life. 
mm-hmm. and stuff. So that that was interesting. So there is a point, a trigger for, but that's maybe one person in a thousand. I think there are challenges in the show, and I think there have to be kinds of I have to be kind of careful. But I don't think you can make a conversation about these themes much safer than I have. Like if we can't talk about it in this way with nice pictures and pretty songs and a good piano player, I don't know when we can, really. But they're important things to talk about. Oh, I think it's really important to normalise this stuff. Yeah, they are important and it is important to normalise it, take the stigma yeah. out of it. Mental health is very much a part of health in our communities. At any point it's 25% of people or something, over, over the whole population, it can be up to 50% over people's lifetimes, you know. If we can't talk about it, then we make it worse. There's no question. Just to wrap up this lovely interview with you today, Leah, as part of the I Am Woman Project interview series, one of the questions we like to include is um, what are the three gold nuggets that you'd like to share with our listeners? Number one would be to listen to your inner voices and try and understand when you're being negative towards yourself, trying to strengthen the positive voices inside. Those voices inside shape a lot of your experience and a lot of your potential. So listen to yourself. You might be running yourself down and you need to take a step to deal with that or you might be telling yourself a great big fib and that gets no one anywhere. You'll only hurt other people. So... So I guess that, you know, true to yourself stuff, I think that's really important. Finding ways to live that reflect your values has been a defining feature of everything I do and the closer I get to being able to express my values, the more I feel at home in my own skin. So I can only extrapolate from my experience. And um, and the third one would be that, you know, I haven't cracked it yet and I'm a work in progress so, you know, don't be too hard on me, which you could extrapolate to other people. Everyone's progress. Don't be too hard on them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thanks uh, for joining us today, Leah. Uh, Melissa, good on you. And I'm certain there are lots of people who have and will continue to feel better about their own circumstances because of the things that you've learnt and uh, shared along the way. <laughs> That's a nice thought. All the very best. That brings us to the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed the show as it is my mission to reach out and inspire as many individuals like you. And one of the best ways to help us achieve this goal is by giving us a good review on iTunes. It's easy and it only takes about 10 seconds. If you have any questions or special guests that you would like to hear from, please send us an email to support at katherineplano.com.au and we will get right back to you. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Catherine Plano. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. Until next week, please take care.